Well, good morning, folks. Good morning, morning, folks out there on on the internet, whether you're watching us now or later on, it's good to have you joining us today. Um, We're few in numbers, probably because of the weather. Samuel and family are away this weekend, and uh, Steve, who we know well, has uh, agreed to uh, come and uh, give the message to us again. And uh, Steve will be uh, speaking to us again from Exodus. He's continuing in uh, his series on, on the Exodus. So I look forward to that in a little while. Uh, but to start this morning, we're going to uh, pray the Lord's Prayer together. Join me in, uh, in praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, Steve, would you like to come up the front for a second? For those of you who, who haven't met Steve before, you don't know Steve. Steve is the IFES worker, is that the right description, at, uh, at the university in, in uh, Port. Um, and he's been leading us in a series of uh, studies on the Exodus over the past uh, out there. Ooh, <laughs> few months. <laughs> just come back closer to the mic, I think. Yeah, so oh, is that better? Yeah, that's right. Okay, just moving okay. too far away, keep turning okay. you up. So Steve, um, just bring us up the spirit of what's happening in the uni. What's happening at the uni? Not a lot this week, actually. It's mid-session break. Those uni students, they slack far too often. It's, um, oh, look, God's been really kind. It's been a great year for us. The last couple of years, like, I think for everyone, have been pretty quiet because of COVID, but um, students are back on campus this year. There's lots going on. Um, uh, oh, I'm sure we've had students become Christians this year. So we've had, yeah. Um, uh, and, and as always, there's been a number of students who could have gone either way. They, they leave, they've left home, um, they've struck out on their own, trying to work out who they're going to be as adults. Uh, and so making Christian friends has been really, really significant for a few of them. There's a few who I, like, I'm just realising now how unstable their faith was. Like, I, I, they seemed like they just slotted in and, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, great. Um, and hearing them reflect now on their first six, eight months of uni and realising, oh, actually, if they hadn't made Christian friends, that would have been it. They would have walked away from Jesus by the end of the year. And so that's, you know, it's always a joy to get to this point of year and kind of see that that's happened. And, you know, especially this year where we've got probably 10 or 15 people in that category, whereas the last couple of years it's been one or two people who stuck with us for the year um, because, of, because of COVID. Um, so look, that's going really well. The other thing that's really great news, um, which I asked you to pray about last time I was here, um, my coworker Katie Batten, um, I think last time I was here, we were employing her a day a week. Um, in God's kindness, we've been able to raise that to two and a half days a week now, which is great. It's what we were aiming for. Um, we're still a little bit under 100% of that, but we've got enough money that we can afford to pay her that and we can uh, carry the slight deficit for, I think it's about <laughs> two years, actually. Yeah, um, right. So a bunch of people gave, la- gave one-off lump sums, which has meant, although the monthly income is not enough to pay her, um, there's enough money in the bank that we can do that. So that's something to thank God for. Um, and that's great because it means that she can get on with the job uh, of discipling young women uh, and helping them work out how to evangelise their classmates, um, which is the, th- the very thing we brought her on to do. Um, so that's great that she doesn't have to spend a big chunk of, chunk of her time on support raising anymore. She can get on with the job of actually ministering the gospel, which I'm, I'm super grateful for. Um, yeah, so look, that, that's probably, yeah, right. that's about, yeah, that's enough, I think. Right. Um, but look, thanks for having me again. It's really a great pleasure to be with you. And thanks for putting up with my slow, pondering, plotting series for the book of Exodus. Uh, I think I started with you guys five years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, probably another five years to go. Good right? well, indication, you got it. That's a good indication you've got a long ministry in Port Macquarie. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, look, uh, we understand all about uh, being under budget in terms of income, um, but we also understand about a, a gracious and loving God who provides uh, for his people, and we're, we're very grateful to God. And it's great to hear about what's happening with, uh, with the young people at the uni. So Liz is going to come and read from Exodus chapter 12. If you've got a Bible or your phones there, Exodus chapter 12 starting from verse 21. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Right, verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, 
Go, select an animal from the flock according to your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Take a cluster of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and brush the lintel and the two doorposts with some of the blood in the basin. None of you may go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, he will pass over the door and not let the destroyer enter your houses to strike you. Keep this command permanently as a statute for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you are to observe this ceremony. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You are to reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, and he spared our homes. So the people knelt low and worshipped. Then the Israelites went and did this. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses alone. Now at midnight, the Lord struck every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and every firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he along with all his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud wailing throughout Egypt because there wasn't a house without someone dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and said, Get out immediately from among my people, both you and the Israelites, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take even your flocks and your herds as you asked, and leave, and also bless me. <coughs> now the Egyptians pressured the people in order to send them quickly <coughs> out of the country, for they said, we're all going to die. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, with their kneading bowls wrapped up in the clothes in their, on their shoulders. The Israelites acted on Moses' word and asked the Egyptians for silver and gold items and for clothing. And the Lord gave the people such favour with the Egyptians that they gave them what they requested. In this way, they plundered the Egyptians. The Israelites travelled from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 able-bodied men on foot besides their families. A mixed crowd also went up with them, along with a large number of livestock, both flocks and herds. The people baked the dough as they had brought out of Egypt into unleavened loaves, since it had no yeast. For when they were driven out of Egypt, they could not delay and had not prepared provisions for themselves. The time the, Egypt, the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that same day, all the Lord's military divisions went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of vigil in honour of the Lord, because he would bring them out of the land of Egypt. This same night is in honour of the Lord, a night vigil for all the Israelites throughout their generations. Thanks, Liz. Well, keep that, uh, keep that in your mind, and maybe I don't know how you put a bookmark in your, uh, in your phone, but uh, we're now going to hear... Um, well, it's essentially the follow-on from that, but if you jump to uh, Luke 22, and Vern's going to come and read to us from Luke 22, verse, from verse 7. Then come the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, 
gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table the son of man will go as it has been decreed but woe to the man that betrays him just want to say that uh, you may have noticed out there, you may have noticed in here that we're uh, sort of flying by the seat of our pants this morning, uh, being thrown in uh, at the last minute. But uh, I know Steve is well prepared and uh, I'm going to pray for him before he brings his wishes to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word again. Lord, we thank you for the word of life. And Father, we ask your blessing on our brother Steve now as he uh, brings to today to us this message. Uh, from both Exodus and from, from Jesus in the Lord. And so, Father, we ask your blessing on him. And, Lord, we pray that you will bless us, that we will uh, be hearing what you're saying and, Lord, understanding what you're saying. And, Lord, that through your spirit you will help us to apply that in our lives. And we commit ourselves now to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Oh, look, Rob, you're perhaps being a little bit too confident in me. I'm uh, well, well adept at flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, no, you're, you're right. I, I have prepared this talk, so we should we should be good. Although I, you know, in the spirit of winging it, I realised on Saturday um, after finishing my preparation on Friday that you guys normally use the Holman, and I'm prepared using the NIV. So sorry about that. Um, but the the text that I'm speaking from will be on the screen. Uh, you probably find it helpful to have the Bible open in front of you as well. Just be aware there'll be a few little language differences, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um, Exodus is primarily about the story. Um, you know, at least at least the way, the way I'm working on it is uh, trying to tell the story rather than getting too hung up on individual words. So um, now Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Too. Thank you so much. Uh, my kids love Father's Day. I mean, they, they love any sort of celebration, but um, yeah, they, they love the chance to, to make a, a big deal out of someone. I'm actually I'm surprised they didn't pull out. We have this box of decorations for our house, um, and it's, just, it's a, a string of paper stars, a couple of bits of bunting. <laughs> Anytime it's someone's birthday, my kids insist on dragging these tired old decorations out. The, there's the paper stars we bought for my son's second birthday. He's going to be nine soon. I, I keep meaning to throw them out because they're getting so tatty, but I just can't bring myself to do it. I mean, traditions are a funny thing, aren't they? They're these things we do to kind of help ourselves... They celebrate things that we we either think they're important or we think they should be important to us, right? Um, traditions and, and rituals, they, they have this kind of strange place. Because on the one hand, they help mark an occasion as something important. But on the other, what's the point of going through the motions of, of some ritual that some old fella came up with decades or centuries ago? Um, well, look, what I want to argue this morning is that rituals are essential for a flourishing Christian life. If you want to have a healthy, strong Christian faith, then rituals are vital for that. Now, look, don't take my word for it, though. Let me just give you um, a few examples to maybe kind of get that started. So the thing about rituals that's important is that they're not just an act of remembering, they're an act of participating. That you don't just go, oh, yeah, I think this is important and think about it. You actually do something with your body to kind of get involved in the action. So, I mean, for example, let's say you're at a sporting match and someone in the crowd yells out, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie! Oi, 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 oi. Thank you very much. Exactly, you all know what to do. It's a ritual, right? That there's one part and there's another part and you express your Aussiness by getting involved in the ritual. If you have the identity, you take part. And the reverse is true too. When you take part, you actually embrace the identity. If you don't know what to do, you're in a crowd of Aussies and someone does that and everyone around you kind of knows what to do in response and you're left like, what the heck's going on? You're a bit like a duck in a crowd of, a crowd of platypuses, I reckon. <laughs> now, let's take a more serious example, though. Uh, Anzac Day. Anzac Day, it's not just a memorial service. It, it is that, absolutely. Um, it's not just a day to remember those who have served and died for our country. It's a day to participate with those who have served and died. It's a day to embrace our identity as Anzacs. So, I mean, what do we do? On Anzac Day, um, people who would never get up before eight 
get up before dawn to stand post. Um, you don't just go and watch the march, you pin on the medals of your relative and you march in their place. You participate in, in the march. Um, you might go to the pub for a beer. Um, even someone who doesn't, who would never dream of drinking in public, or shock horror, worst of all, you might even play a game of two up. <laughs> you know, actually, it's the only time in the Australian year that it's legal to gamble anywhere. The rest of the time, you can only gamble in a licensed gambling premises. Anzac Day, it's on for young and old. You can throw two up anywhere and you can't be arrested for it. On Anzac Day, it's un-Australian if you don't. Or at least that's what some people would say. I'm, I'm not sure if that's true. But see, Anzac Day is not just about remembering. It is about remembering, but we remember by participating. It's about who we are as a people. We don't just observe, we join in, and so we embrace the identity. The ritual tells us who we are. Now, rituals... Oh, too far. There we go. Rituals are important in shaping how we see ourselves. As we participate, we look back to the past in order to learn who we are as we move forward. We reenact the past so that we know who we are in the present and who we're going to be in the future. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, ritual and tradition can be dry and dusty and bad. It can be barren soil but it can also be incredibly rich. Traditions can bring great vitality. That is, if the tradition becomes loved and known by the successive generations. You know, take those paper stars that my kids used to decorate the lounge room. If it was just me dragging them out every time we had a, a celebration, they'd be like, oh, Dad, not the paper stars again. <laughs> but they'd embrace that tradition. They, they love decorating the house. And they'd be... They'd be um, gutted if I was to ever dispose of those paper stars, no matter how dreadful looking they become. If we embrace the identity uh, that the ritual conveys, then the ritual brings life, not death. Now, as Christians, our primary rituals are baptism and the Lord's Supper. We call them the sacraments. So we even have a special name for them. We think they're so important. And these two rituals, they tell us who we are. They're essential for a flourishing Christian life. So in baptism, we participate in the burial of Jesus. You get plunged under the water, which is a symbol of being plunged into the earth, and then you come out again to new life, symbolic of Jesus' resurrection from death to life. I have this crazy idea, and I'm probably never going to do it. I probably shouldn't really say this on Facebook. <laughs> but I, I call it the full earth baptism. I just, what, you know, I mean, the symbolism is that you die and rise, right? Just one day, I, I would love to bury someone and then dig them up again. It, it's probably going to go wrong, so I'm probably never going to do it. But oh, as you participate in the ritual, you embrace the identity. In the Lord's Supper, we symbolically participate in the breaking of Jesus' body and the pouring out of his blood. And then as we feed on the bread and the wine, we declare that we feed on him in our hearts by faith. We declare that we are united to Jesus, that he is the source of our life, that he is in us and we are in him. And so if you have the identity, then you embrace the ritual. And when you perform the ritual, you embrace the identity. Now, when Jesus ate his last supper with his disciples, he told them to keep breaking bread and sharing the cup as a way of remembering him. And that's why we still do it, even today, 2,000 years later. But Jesus did that. He told his disciples that in the context of a very, a very particular context. It was part of a Jewish Passover meal, which was an annual Jewish ritual. So Jesus didn't create this ritual out of nothing. He took an existing ritual, Passover, and he layered additional meaning on top of it. Because what was true of the Passover was even more true of Jesus' death. So that makes me ask the question, well, what was the Passover about? 
What was it that the Jews were remembering by participating in annually? What was the identity that they were trying to take on? And why did Jesus use that to describe his death? What we're going to do is flick over, flick back to Exodus in your Bible, Exodus 12, if, if you want to follow along. We're going to have a look at the first Passover and see what was it that the Jews were remembering what identity were they creating for themselves? Let's pray as we do that, shall we? Uh, Almighty Father, thank you for the chance uh, to open your word together. Uh, thanks that even though it's wet outside, it's warm and dry in here. Uh, and Father, thank you that your word feeds us. Uh, Lord, please, uh, as we consider it now, please help <coughs> us to hear your voice and to think your thoughts after you. Uh, please, Lord, uh, make us give us a deeper trust in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so it's been five years. So let me look, let me recap the book of Exodus <laughs> just briefly. Um, so Exodus is really the story of God's faithfulness to his promises to Abraham. Abraham, the ancestor of Israel. And I think I've got a slide. No, that'll do. Yep. Remember, God does what he says he'll do. That, that's the big message of the book of Exodus. God does what he said he'll do. So hundreds of years earlier, God had made some promises to Abraham. And remember, God does what he says he'll do. So he promised Abraham that his people would be as many as the, south, <coughs> as the grains of sand on the beach. Israel would be God's people. God had promised that they would live in God's place, the land of Canaan, which stretched from the great river Euphrates in the north all the way to the Wadi of Egypt in the south. Wadi is just a word for a creek bed. Um, they, would, they, they would be God's people in God's place and they would live under God's blessing and rule. Whoever blessed them would be blessed and whoever cursed them would be cursed and all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through the descendants of Abraham. Now, at the start of the book of Exodus, uh, the Israelites, the family of Abraham, moved to Egypt because of a famine. And there, over a couple of centuries, and the extended family grew into an uncountable multitude that plagued the land of Egypt. Now, the Pharaoh was troubled by this vast slave population, and so he tried to reduce their numbers through slave labour, through secretly ordering the murder of baby boys, and then when that failed, by finally openly commanding that all baby boys born to the Israelites be thrown into the Nile River. But his plans backfired the people of Israel continued to increase in number. And his own daughter even rescued a baby Israelite boy from the river, and she adopted him as her own son, Moses, an Israelite, a member of the royal family. Oops. See, you can't stop God from being faithful to his promises. Remember, God does what he says he'll do. So when Moses grew up, he tried to rescue his people, or at least to try and lessen their suffering a bit. But he wasn't a very good hero, and so he stuffed it up and accidentally killed an Egyptian, and he had to run for his life. He ended up living as a stranger in a strange land. And it wasn't until 40 years later, when Moses was 80, that God appeared to him and declared that he was going to do what he promised you just turned 80, Vern? There you go. Imagine that. Yeah. Just getting started on your life's work at 80. God was going to take Israel to be his people in his place, living under his blessing and rule. And so God sent 80-year-old Moses back to, to Egypt to bring his people, Israel, out of slavery. Sounds simple, right? Easy mission. Only one problem. Just one. The Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. How could God keep his promises to Abraham if the Pharaoh wouldn't let them go? How could Israel become God's people, living in God's place, under his blessing and rule, if Pharaoh would not give up his slaves? Pharaoh considered himself to have divine authority, and so he refused to recognize the God of Israel. And this led to a divine conflict. A series of plagues, each more serious than the last. Frogs, gnats, boils, hail, locusts, darkness. The plagues mocked the power and authority of Pharaoh. He could not resist the God of Israel. And yet he would not surrender. He would not release his slaves. 
And so the conflict escalated to the point that Pharaoh threatened Moses. Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. For the day you see my face, you'll die. <coughs> oh. The passage we're looking at today is the climax of this narrative arc. This conflict between Pharaoh and the God of Israel. Now, it's not the final climax of God keeping his promises to Abraham. That actually remains the driving problem through the whole Old Testament until we come to Jesus. And in fact, it even kind of still remains today as we await the new creation when we will be God's people in his place, the new creation living under the blessing of being in his presence. We're still awaiting the full and final resolution of those promises. Um, But Exodus 12 is the resolution of the Pharaoh problem. Pharaoh refused to let Israel go and worship their God. He refused to let God keep his promises. And so here we see God overcome Pharaoh as an obstacle. So that Pharaoh and the Egyptians and Israel and the whole world might remember that the Lord God of Israel, he does what he says he'll do. The book of Exodus is all about God keeping his promises. Remember, God does what he says he'll do. And this point is driven home in our story today four times. Uh, We're going to take them in reverse, which is a bit weird, but just stick with me. It'll make sense. Um, So the last one uh, is that at Mount Sinai, God had said to Moses that he would bring the Israelites out of slavery. So Exodus 3 verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, so I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So that's what God had said. God said he would bring them out of slavery, and it's also exactly what he did. Have a look at how how the story ends. Exodus 12, verse 37. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, There are about 600,000 people, men on foot, besides women and children. Many other people went up with them also. Uh, And also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they'd been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now, the time the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. See, through what happened at the Passover, and we'll get to that in a sec, through the Passover, God kept the promises he'd made to Moses. He said he would bring Israel out of slavery, and then he did it. Remember, God does what he says he'll do. God also promised that when... When Israel left Egypt, they would not leave as beggars. The Egyptian people would give them, freely give them gold and silver and clothing, a sort of back payment for the wages they were owed. So Exodus 3, back at Mount Sinai, God said, and I'll make the uh, Egyptians favourably disposed towards these people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbour and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. God promised that if Israel asked, they would receive gold, silver and clothing. And that's exactly what happened. Exodus 12. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of gold and silver and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favourably disposed towards the people And they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. See, through what happened in the Passover, and we'll get to that in a sec, through the Passover, God kept the promise he'd made through Moses. He he said that the Egyptians would give the Israelites gold and silver and clothing if they asked. And then he did it. Remember, God does what he says he'll do. Through Moses, God promised to take Israel out of slavery, and then he did it. He promised that the Egyptians would pay them to leave, and then he did it. God also promised 
that through God also promised through Moses that Pharaoh would not just let them go, Pharaoh would make them go. Mount Sinai again, Exodus 3. Now, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I, the Lord, will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I'll perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And again, just before the Passover, now the Lord said to Moses, I'll bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Pharaoh was totally opposed to letting the people of Israel go. And God knew that Pharaoh would stand in the way of God keeping his promises. He knew Pharaoh would not let Israel go. And yet, even before Moses went back to Egypt, God promised that not only would Pharaoh let them go, not only would he give in, in the end, he would be eager to get rid of them. And that's exactly how it turned out. Exodus 12. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go. Worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you've said and and go. And bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs, wrapped in clothing. Through what happened in the Passover, and we're coming to that now, through the Passover... God kept the promises he'd made through Moses. God promised that he would make Pharaoh drive Israel away. And then he did it. Remember, God does exactly what he says he'll do. Okay, now the Passover. We've worked backwards, um, sort of least important to most important. The final (laughs) and most dreadful of the ten plagues. God promised the Passover in advance, and then he did it. And he actually promises it three times in 30 verses. That's really, really fast. So just after Pharaoh had threatened Moses with death, Moses responded, This is what the Lord says. Yep, that's what that's it. At midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, Who's at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There'll be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or will ever be. The Lord God Himself would pass through Egypt, and the firstborn son in every house would die. God then repeated this promise to Moses, to Moses and Aaron in the first part of chapter 12. And I won't read it again because it's very similar. Um, But there is an added instruction about a sacrifice. The Israelites were to kill and eat a lamb for each household. And then they were to take the blood of that lamb and paint it on the doorframe of each house. So let me read just that little bit of it. Um, Exodus 12, verse 12. On that same night, I, the Lord, will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. See, when God passed through Egypt, striking down the firstborn son of every house, he would pass over (coughs) any house that had already killed a lamb as a substitute. The blood would turn aside this final destructive plague. Now, the New Testament describes Jesus as our Passover lamb. Just as the lamb's blood turned aside God's judgment from the Israelite houses, so the blood of Jesus turns God's wrath and judgment aside from us. See, we we are no better than Pharaoh. We don't want God to be God. 
We want to decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We want to decide how we, we want to decide how we're going to spend our lives. And yet, the punishment for our refusal to let God be God is turned away from us by the blood of Jesus. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us, painted on the doorway of our lives. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If we are washed by his blood, then God's judgment will not fall on us, for it's already fallen on Jesus. He's already died in our place, and so we will live with him. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. God promised this final plague to Pharaoh. He promised it to Moses and Aaron, and then he promised it a third time to the elders of Israel. Exodus 12, verse 21. Uh, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once, select the animals for your family and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the doorframe. None of you should go out of your door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Three times, the Lord God declared the Passover in advance. Three times, he said clearly what he was going to do. And then he did it. Exodus 12, verse 28. The Israelites did what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night. And there was loud wailing in Egypt. For there was not a house without someone dead. The conflict between Pharaoh, the god of Egypt, and Yahweh, the god of Israel, came to a head. The Lord God struck down the firstborn of Egypt. Remember, God does what he says he'll do. And through the ten plagues, and through this final plague, most of all, the Lord God humiliated Pharaoh and all the gods of Egypt. The Lord showed that they were utterly powerless before him. For all Pharaoh's tough talk, he could do nothing to protect his land or his people. He couldn't even protect his own son. This is the climax of this story arc. Pharaoh would not let Israel go. He would not allow God to keep his promises. And so God unleashed this final destructive plague. Now, normally when we think about the climax of a story, we think triumph. But this is not a triumph, is it? It's a tragedy. Imagine if every house in Warhope had someone die in it. It gives you a sense of the scale of what happened here. This is what Pharaoh's obstinate sin accomplished. The death of the firstborn of his entire people. No wonder there was loud wailing in Egypt that night. Back in Exodus 3, it had been the wailing of the Egyptians that had reached the Lord God's ears. Sorry, I got that completely wrong. Back in (laughs) Exodus 3, it had been the Israelites under their Egyptian slave drivers that had been wailing. It was their wailing that reached the Lord God's ears. But now, it was the Egyptians who wailed because God's judgment had fallen on them. And yet, this was less than absolute justice. For Pharaoh had sought to murder an entire generation of Israelite boys. In retribution, the Lord took only the firstborn of Egypt. For all the horror of this event, This is justice mixed with mercy. 
For God did not treat Pharaoh as his sins truly deserved. Remember, the Lord God does what he says he'll do. Well, so what? Even before that very first Passover, God told the people of Israel that this was an event that they should remember. They were to reenact this Passover event every year by eating lamb and painting the blood of that lamb on the door frames of their houses. And for seven days afterwards, they were to reenact the haste of the Exodus, that hasty departure in the middle of the night. They were to reenact the lack of provisions that they had by only eating flatbread, bread made without yeast, made in a hurry. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You should commemorate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. This is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of Israel in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand, a reminder on your forehead that this law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. See, every year the people of Israel were to reenact the Passover and the Exodus so that every generation would see themselves as participants in it. I do this because of what the Lord did for me. The Lord passed over our houses. The Passover was the great salvation event in which God decisively took Israel to be his people in his place under his blessing and rule. Now, the details were still to be worked out. They weren't yet in God's promised land. And that's what Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, there's there's lots more story to go. But every year, God's people Israel were to perform this ritual so that they and their children might know who they are. The people of the Lord, bought out of slavery by the blood of the Lamb. How about us? Rituals are essential for a flourishing Christian life. Rituals tell us who we are. If you have the identity, you participate in the ritual. And when you perform the ritual, you embrace the identity. So don't be afraid of rituals. They give meaning to your life. They tell you who you are. We look back in order to learn who we are as we move forward. We remember the past so that we know who we are in the present and the future. The Lord's Supper is an extra layer of meaning over the Passover. Just as the Israelites participated in the Exodus by eating the Passover... We participate in the death and resurrection of Jesus by eating the supper. They saw themselves as the people of God who come out of slavery by the blood of the Lamb. We see ourselves as the people of Jesus who've come out of slavery to death and sin and into new life through the death of Jesus, our Passover Lamb. So don't be afraid of ritual, especially Christian ritual. Embrace them. Because the ritual, it tells you who you are. You are the people of Jesus, saved by the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, thank you for the power of rituals, not just to remind us of things, but that we might participate and embody them. 
We thank you for the death of Jesus and all that it means to us. We thank you that he, his blood was poured out and his body was broken and to purchase us from slavery to sin and death. Lord, help us not just to remember that, but to embrace that identity. Lord, please make that who we are. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thanks, Steve. Well, uh, let's continue in prayer and we'll come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for uh, what Steve has just brought to us. And Father, for that, um, that powerful reminder of uh, what the Passover was about. But Father, as he said, the extra layer of meaning, most important layer of meaning that, uh, that Jesus gives it uh, in terms of his own uh, death and resurrection. Father, we, we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray that um, you would help us to be faithful in uh, reading your word, uh, taking it in, pondering it, chewing it over, discussing it, talking about it. So, Lord, that in that sense it becomes part of us. And Father, we thank you that, uh, as Steve said earlier, Lord, that your word is at work in the world, and uh, Father, particularly in the university here. And Father, we, uh, we thank you for that, Lord, we thank you for every uh, life and that is saved of every, every um, person who comes into the kingdom. And Father, we pray that that, uh, that trickle that might be at the moment stream, Lord, would, uh, would turn into a flood. And indeed, Father, we pray that rather, uh, rather than having a dead person in every household in Warhope, Lord, we pray for uh, living people in every household, living people who have been uh, born into new life uh, through Jesus. So, Father, we ask for that miracle in our town, uh, Lord, as we see in lots of ways so much deadness around us. Father, we pray for the missionaries and uh, the preachers who take your word out to the world. And, Lord, we know, uh, each of us know, different people who are doing that in different parts of the world or getting ready to go to do that. Mm-hmm. Father, we ask that uh, you will help us to be encouraging of them uh, and Father, being able to support them uh, financially, but also uh, with our prayers. And Lord, as we think of the world uh, out there, uh, Father, we pray this morning for the big issues that are going on in the world uh, at the moment. Uh, Father, starvation in some places, uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees living in camps in the desert that have been set up for them in appalling conditions. Father, suffering, uh, many people suffering from a civil war or war of uh, one country against another. And Lord, on top of that, of course, there's all the in- interpersonal conflict uh, between people and relationships in the workplace and so on. Father, this is a world that desperately needs to hear the message of Jesus. And Father, we pray that um, more and more that will happen, we'll see people turning to him. Father, amongst those uh, things that are that are happening that are causing so much um, anguish and, and trouble for people is the housing crisis in our own country where so many uh, people simply cannot find a place, a roof over their head, living in tents, uh, in their cars. And Father, this should not be. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, work in the minds of our governments Father, that they might work together to, uh, to make policy changes that will actually impact that situation. Lord, we know that there are enough bedrooms in Australia to house everyone. But Father, uh, we need change from the top down uh, to make that possible so that everybody has a safe place to sleep. Lord, we think too of COVID and the impact that that's having uh, on us, on our society and around the world. Lord, this morning we particularly pray for Danny that, uh, in fact, he, he hasn't got COVID. We, we pray, Lord, that this might be a false alarm. But, Lord, we pray that uh, you would return him to, uh, to good health quickly. And, Father, for others uh, in our congregation and families that we know who are um, suffering illness or pain from operations that they've had or operations that they're waiting for, Lord, we ask that you would, uh, you would bring healing and Father, that you would, uh, in the midst of that, Lord, 
and find what now uh, your comfort. Father, again, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, help it to be uh, written on our foreheads and on our wrists. And Father, um, be shining from us wherever we are, whatever we're doing, that we, we will be uh, good messages of the gospel uh, to those around us. Father, we commit all these things uh, to you in Jesus' precious name, who died for us and became our Saviour. Amen. Well, thank you, folks, for being here today, and thank you for people who are out there on, uh, on YouTube or Facebook or watching us now or later. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we hope you'll be with us again next week. In a moment, we'll close, and then uh, we'll have just a one or two announcements. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we go from here today, Lord, we ask your blessing on us. Father, we are frail in ourselves. Uh, Father, we are of weak will. Uh, Lord, we are cowardly. Uh, Father, we are subject to uh, temptation and giving in to it. But Father, we can look to you for strength because Jesus was raised from the dead and lives with you and is coming back. So Father, in his name we ask that you would strengthen us and bless us as we go from here as your people today. In his name. Amen. Amen.